Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm devastated, actually. I'm bringing Sophie with me today as well, so you don't just see the technology guys. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. I think just before we start, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been very fortunate in the past 20 years to work in different industries that have seen uh, substantial transformation through technology. Uh, in the music industry, I was fortunate enough to work on the programs that took uh, us from CD devices through to uh, digital downloads and therefore transforming the industry and the way in which music is consumed. Um, I subsequently then went into the fashion industry where we did the same thing. I was at the ASOS business. Um, and it was at this time, interestingly enough, where I, I saw the challenges in the, in the healthcare sector. It was at a time where uh, my grandmother was uh, unfortunately sick. She'd gone into hospital for a relatively straightforward uh, uh, procedure. And um, I, at the time of being there to visit her, I was receiving regular updates as I did running all of the <coughs> logistics and the technology group in terms of our orders that were coming through. And uh, more importantly, those sort of very small percentage of uh, customers that wouldn't get served. And one thing really struck me when I looked at the hospital. First of all, there were probably no more than <coughs> excuse me, 200 patients in there. We're probably equivalent of about 100, 200 staff. And just the complete lack of communication, um, the complete lack of systems and automation, and yet there was a lot of technology around. Um, it, it got me really thinking, how can I be in an industry where the little black dress that doesn't arrive at 5 o'clock at 5 p.m. because it's been ordered at 4 o'clock the day before, and yet we're in a sector where this seriously means a problem for people if they're sick and they can't get the right access to the healthcare at the time they need it, um, has far more uh, serious consequences. Um, I was fortunate then to meet up with Ali Parsa. We worked together at Circle as a uh, private hospital group. And there again, I think what I saw was that although we did a lot with hospitals to try to transform the way in which hospitals operated, the problem stemmed further. The issue really is way beyond when somebody is sick. This is about how do you stay well on the very first instance. Um, I don't have my, oh, you've got it great. Yeah, I'll click it, cool. Um, okay, so I'll take you back through a bit of the background in terms of healthcare and why we think this is an important sector to start transforming and what we're doing more specifically at Babylon. Um, Sophie is a really important part of our team. Sophie's representing a part of our uh, clinical group that work with us. I think Sophie is one of our new generation of doctors. Uh, so she's grown up within the technology era. She understands, uh, she's a trained medic, trained doctor, so I'm sure you'll give an introduction to yourself. And um, I think what you'll start seeing is as these technologies get built and deployed, particularly around the areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, Babylon's working really, really uh, cleverly with a, a group of um, medics to ensure that this is being trained in exactly the right way. Okay, so... When you think about the health sector, so there's some fascinating statistics that often don't get quoted, but we know already that there's 50% of the world's population doesn't actually have access to health care. If you take that one step further into one of the developed countries, probably one of the best health care systems in the world, we know that one in four practices have average waiting times of two to three weeks. Mm. I don't know what your guys' schedule's like, but when I'm ill, I'm ill straight away, and two to three weeks in my life may as well be five years from now. I mean, I have no idea what Gary's going to ask me to do of a Thursday morning in two to three weeks' time, and whether I'll be able to make my doctor's appointment. So it's a real problem for people, not only in the developing world, but in the developed world, having access to good quality primary care. If we pull out some of the key stats as well, so... Um Again, if we stick with the UK, but uh, essentially one in eight of us are not able to get to see a doctor as and when we need to. Difficult in, in busy schedules, but also very difficult for people that have immediate needs for healthcare. One in five with serious conditions are misdiagnosed uh, at, at the first case. And this is actually quite serious. I actually have um, numerous friends that have been misdiagnosed with uh, cancers. Um, you know, this is not the fault of the doctors. They are very busy schedules. It's often when you, when you trace it right back to the process of diagnosis, you realise it's around the questions that have been asked. Sometimes the individual's not always giving the right sort of evidence as well. And then we look at the, the diagnostic accuracy. In the developed worlds, we're operating at about 80% of the diagnosis is accurate. In the developing worlds, it's, it's substantially poorer. We're operating at about uh, 50%. I think we, we quote from these stats here, 40%, which is even less. Mm -hmm. And we know already um, that one of four consultations that we're having with our doctors are really not necessary. They can be avoided through early indication of uh, conditions or better access to correct information. 
And what we find fascinating is we already exist in a world today where most people have a mobile device. Most people have their iPads or their uh, Samsung devices or their iPhones. And uh, the cost of diagnosis is additionally dropping at an alarming rate. We'll go into a bit more about this in a second. Sophie's going to give us some information about this. Access to the quantities of information through the uh, ver various devices. So you've got smartphones, you've got wearable technology, you've got uh, clothing that we're now seeing that uh, is being supplied to athletes that can actually detect performance of the uh, individuals. And we're really at an exciting point with technology. I've seen it, as I mentioned earlier, through different industries, retail, but also over the past 20 years. And what I'm seeing now is a pace of growth which I've never seen before. So this gives me enormous hope. You've seen the presentation before in terms of how can some of this information get stored. So the challenge is we think about when we start thinking about how do we break down the human body and think about how we um, analyze and diagnose all of the conditions, you've now got new means of storage which is going to make that possible as well. So this, this environment is moving incredibly quickly. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I'll hand over to Sophie just to give you a few points on the uh, diagnostic components and the medical components. So my name is Sophie. I was a junior doctor at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge, um, which is one of the first paperless hospitals in the country. So as Gary was talking about the um, use of technology in secondary care and the joined up meanings that that has, I really got an insight into where the future of secondary care is going and it was really exciting. Um, everything we did was on a computer, everything was linked up, but what it wasn't linked up to was our patients' GP practices. So we have people coming in and there's all this information about them outside that we simply didn't have access to. And we gathered all this fantastic information, but we weren't able to translate it. And I'll talk a bit about how we're trying to solve that problem. But really the time for healthcare and its digital transformation is now. And it's now because of the four points that we saw on the previous slide. The first one is that diagnostics is reducing in cost year on year. Um, we've had some great talks already about genome sequencing and the potential for having a 99% cost reduction in the last 10 years, um, the £100,000 question. We also have Babylon test kits already, so you can do finger prick testing at home for multiple conditions. You don't need to go into a doctor, so when you see the doctor, you already have the test results and you can start talking about what the next steps are. And suddenly your efficiency from symptom to diagnosis to management becomes so much quicker. But as Gary was saying, the future of technology, as we just heard from that fantastic talk on DNA storage, is really, really limitless. Um, you have Genolite, which are a fantastic company, looking at light-powered blood tests using um, silicon microraw res resonators to look at the refraction of light through blood and get a diagnosis that way. Imagine a world where you don't have to prick your finger, when you don't have to have a needle. I don't know if any of you don't like needles. I had a tooth out recently and I put a needle in my mouth. I'm a doctor. I was terrified. It was awful. Um, imagine a world where you wouldn't have to have a needle for a blood test. And wearable technology. Obviously, we're in a room of early adopters. I'm sure most of you have got Fitbits. Has anyone reached their 10,000 steps today? Probably not. But I'm talking about clothing. As Gary was saying, um, there are lots of different clothing companies looking at athletes. But beyond that, into your daily lives, you have Jacquard by Google, which is a great collaboration they're doing with Levi's, looking at clothing that you want to wear, normal, everyday clothes that will monitor your heart rate, your temperature, everything. And taking that quantified self and an understanding of how you are right now into your healthcare device will be incredibly powerful. The other thing is the freedom of information. Um, obviously, the 20th century was the age of information, but the 21st century will really be about this real-time data collection, about wearables that give us results about how you are now. If anyone's ever tried to have their blood pressure taken at the doctor, it always gives you a bizarre reading because you're really nervous and then this thing squeezes your arm and it's tight and it's horrible and your blood pressure goes through the roof and then he says, it's all right, calm down and I'll do it again. Does anyone calm down? No, they do not calm down. But at home monitoring, being able to take real data of how you are moving through your daily life when you're not stressed in front of a doctor will be a huge deal for medicine. And the access that we have to big data, which is becoming easier and easier to get hold of large data sets. And big data means big insights into population health, not just on a global level, but also on a local level. So imagine a world where your phone can say, actually, there's been an outbreak of flu in your area recently. You might want to stay at home. You might want to wrap up warm. And the democratization, long word, of technology, access to mobile phones, they have a 65% global penetration. 
65%. Healthcare, as Gary said, has a 50% global penetration. So if you can put healthcare on a mobile phone, you increase global penetration by 15%. That's a billion people, and that's the population of Africa. Think about the power that that would give people. And the capability of these phones is doubling year on year, as we know from Moore's law. And that means that my phone, in five years' time, it does 3% now of what it will do in five years' time. I don't know what it doesn't do right now. It runs my whole life. I'd be lost without it. We also have virtual assistants. We recently got a Google Home. It's very interesting. Um, but the thing that virtual assistants are really doing are, for the younger generations, getting that technology into people's homes completely changing the way we interact and accept technology in our private lives. And that is fundamental to being able to deliver healthcare in a technological space. And the advent of artificial intelligence. For any of you who weren't aware, you're living in the advent of artificial intelligence. Congratulations, it's an exciting time. Uh, this is really important because medical knowledge, as we've seen from the fantastic speakers today, is doubling every 18 months. I can't imagine sitting my exams every year, having to learn everything I've already learned, plus double I don't think my brain could cope with it as much as I hope my brain is reasonably sound. But artificial intelligence can. With NLP and machine learning, we can process and communicate information using word to vec just like a human. With probability theories, we can reason like a doctor and give accurate information. And cognitive graphs and the fantastic DNA technologies that are being developed are allowing storage of data, high volumes of complex data. And that is exactly what healthcare needs to have to be able to technologically revolutionise. I'll pass it over to Gary to talk about Babylon. Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, so, as, uh, as mentioned, basically our mission, Babylon has been founded to put accessible and affordable health service into uh, every human being's <coughs> hands around the earth. We started this venture off not with a view of just solving the problems locally, but globally. Um, if we can just move on. Sorry, I forgot my clicker again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how are we going to achieve this? And we've got to conscious of time, and I, Rakesh, I promise I will fill on, finish on time. Uh, we've assembled a team, basically, across uh, the science community, the medical community, um, classic product engineering, including e-commerce, logistics. In interoperability is obviously critical for us. We have to communicate with many downstream platforms, including a lot of the wearable devices and the new technologies that are coming out. Um, if we can move back on again, sorry. And uh, I just wanted to show you this one slide, and then we'll cut on to a, a short video. But essentially, if you look at um, the dimension of what we're building on the on the uh, left here, what we have is the simple side of things. So you need access to a doctor. We can triage you very quickly through a series of questions. That's moving on to our next stage of um, being able to diagnose by asking just questions and feeding it through our artificial intelligence processes. Um, at that point, if you still need a doctor, we'll connect you to a doctor through your mobile technology. All of that is still the sick care model. And what we're doing as you go to the right of the uh, spectrum, we're starting now to focus on how do we present, how do we prevent you from being sick. We need to get your clinical records, we need to get your medical records. As genetic testing becomes more available, we will ingest this information. We will uh, connect this to the devices that you're uh, working with during your day and at the home. And we will use our technology to get this into a preventative uh, place. Uh, I think we're going to do the short video now. I'm looking out there because I'm sure I said cut there to video. And Babylon is about providing affordable and accessible healthcare into the hands of every person on earth. And to do that, we're going to be using artificial intelligence. So the diagnostic engine that we're building at Babylon works in very much the same way that a human doctor works. Uh, it will ask a series of increasingly relevant questions about a patient and ultimately pinpointing the disease or medical condition which it has most confidence in. So what we see when we've put the diagnostic engine up against human doctors in our internal clinical validation is that it performs as well as human doctors in terms of the accuracy and actually the speed of the diagnosis is significantly faster. So uh, Saurabh there, who is um, one of the scientists that are leading out on our um, efforts for artificial intelligence. Uh, I've got about 20 seconds left, uh, so I, I appreciate it's a whistle-stop tour, but I think we've tried to ingest as much as we could in and the 15 the minutes. Prediction. The bold prediction, wow, that didn't come through on my statement, but I'll give you one. Um, the bold prediction, I think the, the view, our view would be quite simply that over the next five years, or in five years, uh, machines will do more of your diagnosis, so more humans would be diagnosed by machines. 
If you take that further forward to 10 or 15 years, um, I predict that actually the machines will start predicting the conditions before they start happening. That will become part of our normal living lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.